Okay, I'm from Argentina. My name is Abdul Matin. That's a Muslim given name. I didn't choose it. It was. It came from a from a sheikh. And I what else? Yes, I'm 32, and I've been a Muslim for more or less 10 years. Yes, and we came we came to to Islam only because of uh, of Maulana, of Sheikh Nasim. I personally, me, or many of us, not only me, we came through looking at him only, impressed by him. It was mostly about that. Well, I, it was more or less a normal life yeah, in Argentina, in Mendoza, those years. And I was studying sociology in university. Uh, what? Yeah, but not much more than that, only that life has lost a bit of its taste. We were not believing in anything, of course. We were actually against belief. We, we didn't know anything better than that, because uh, religion in, in many places, including Argentina, is something void, it's, it's just a shallow, uh, like, fixing for your life a little bit. And it was considered by us, many, uh, as a, something to fix your psychological issues or because you cannot deal with reality. So for us, religion was a bit of a nonsense. And most of the religious people I met, they looked like they were faking, actually. It was not nothing you can really feel. They were not inspiring people. Opposite of what I saw after that, when I grew a bit older, I was about 20, 21, and, and I met one elder murid of, of Maulana, of Sheikh Nasim, and I, got, I was impressed by the beauty, light, you know, but it's hard to call it light because in that time I was not looking at light. I did it because <coughs> when people say light, you imagine someone who is glowing or something. No, I didn't see that. You know, it was not like a straightforward spiritual opening, but it was just looking at someone who has some kind of natural beauty and attraction somehow. And he was coming from a different reality, it looked like. It was not like all the other things I've seen. I was somehow looking for something. But the main thing is that I didn't know what I was looking for. You just don't know. Well, in Argentina, you know, in, in those years mostly, there was not Islam around us. There were no masjids. There were no like uh, maybe there were Muslims, but you don't you can tell they they don't look like Muslims. <laughs> they look like you and like me and like everyone else. But there was not like uh, Adhan or I think I saw Arabic language just one time when I was young, and one relative went to Emirates I think, and he had something written in Arabic. It was. I mean, it was very unfamiliar for all of us. There was no Muslims to refer to and to have like some kind of consciousness about it. And it was not, in those years when I was young, it was not in the media like now about terrorism and this. And no, it was not there. We were not, we didn't have those European issues. No, Alhamdulillah, we didn't have that. So we came to, is, to Islam without knowing that we were going to Islam. We just met people who, who were inspiring here you know, because of Maulana, because of Tarika, because of uh, genuine brothers who were also looking for, for spirituality, maybe. And we were inspired by, by them as well. I saw generosity, I saw brotherhood, I saw f familiarity as well, the, the, the idea of family as well. When I was young, there was still this thing about family lifestyle in Argentina, we were getting together with my grandparents, with uncles, these cousins, every weekend more or less. There was still this connective or connectivity yani, between families, I don't know what to say. But then gradually all that thing got, uh, it, it went down. We stopped meeting with our family and this and that. Then you get busy with your job and people even died and some they left. And most of us, we, we left Argentina as well. So families got dissolved. 
and also uh, in Costa Rica, I found like, again like that uh, taste for family as well. Also, nowadays it's hard to tell because Islam nowadays is far from its roots, very far, regretfully. But in its all, in this thing about brotherhood, this thing about calling everyone a brother or a sister or this and that, brings you back to your nature. That's what I'm trying to say, I think. But of course, we didn't know any of these things in the beginning. It's just a feeling you get. It's just natural attraction. And yeah, I was looking for something. I met a few people from other tarikas. I learned a bit of yoga. I was reading books or meditation, this and that. Nothing big, but we were learning a bit. But when I saw this elder brother, Jan, it was, wow, that was a big difference to, to see things with your own eyes. Then I really said, okay, this, this is real. This is, this is not a movie, this is not a picture. And then I started, yeah, that was the main thing. It was not about researching on the internet, it was not about going to a masjid. It was not a process of uh, this kind of like social study about what is really, no, no. It was not an intellectual process, my process. It was just a, just a very natural journey. Well, as I was saying, it was mostly about meeting the people. It was uh, to meet first this el elder brother, Jan. But it was a bit miraculous as well. I always forget to tell these uh, miracles, and that's the main thing about my story. Not this, that it doesn't sound very interesting, but because when I met him, it was a meeting. They were, he gave a speech, and then I came to him. And usually I do translation because no, not always there's people who, who knows English and Spanish quite well in order to make a translation. So that's something that I do every now and then, not as a job. And he was looking at me, waiting for the translation from someone else. It was something very simple, nothing difficult. And I was looking at him. We, we were looking at our, each other's eyes. And he was waiting for the answer, which was maybe one sentence, something simple. And I tried, I was trying to, to say the answer, but I couldn't. Uh, I mean, my tongue didn't move. We kept like staring at each other <laughs> for a few seconds or something like that. Uh, and then someone else gave the answer. It never happened that before or after in my life, never. So there was a moment there that we stayed there, like the movie went into pause and, and something happened there, yeah. Then I started to go to the meeting, Shani, Thursday night at Zikr, and I met other brothers, and then things went like that. But you know, after that, maybe one year after that, another brother told us that, that he, this, this elder Murid that I met, he, he shared a, a, a dream he had in which he, he saw Prophet Muhammad وسلم, on a dream and in that dream he وسلم, Prophet was telling him look at people in the eyes so uh, then I think that there was something that happened there that they were they were giving something to me which I was completely unconscious about it and then I had like a bit of comings and goings but then I, I stayed I stayed in Islam or in Tarika maybe only because of that moment and only because I saw that reality even though then you see real people with mistakes, with, with shortcomings, with problems but because of that, uh, that uh, moment of beauty as well and reality and things I cannot explain which is like this kind of miracles then I stayed and I stayed and I stayed just Maybe trying to find out. Maybe I'm still trying to find out what happened. Either, and there was something interesting as well. After that, well, you know, usually sometimes I forget about the dreams I have, or I just don't, can't see much. And it happens that someone else comes and tells me a dream, which has nothing to do with them, because the dream is for me. But <laughs> it's like Allah knows that I will forget, so he brings someone to tell me about that dream. It happened three times. At the beginning, I didn't know. So my sister came one day, <coughs> and she told me, 
you know, I saw you, about me, speaking about me, I saw you on a dream, and you were pregnant. I said, well, thank you, but I don't know what that means. I'm not expecting a child yet. But after a while, I met him, I met Diesel de Murillo again, in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. That was maybe one year or two years after that. And I told him about this dream. And he told me, no, that is because you are spiritually pregnant. There was something that it came to me, and maybe it's waiting to come out to the surface till today. Because the rest is just a normal story. I just started to go to Dikr, I met people, and, and I learned a bit about Islam, even though I didn't learn much. I, I was not learning Arabic, I was not learning Quran. I was just imitating a little bit. Uh, even the thing is strange because then people ask me, are you Muslim? And I said, well, I don't know, but, but I was. Yani, but <laughs> up to some extent, it was so natural for us that I didn't even know that because we came like to Sufism, Yani, or something like that. We were not like, like, a, like trained as a Muslim. I said, you need to do these five pillars. You, this is far, this is halal, this is... No, no, that came way after that, way after that, yeah. And also because in the place I come from, there was no massive. People were asking me what happened when you first time heard Adam, the prayer to the prayer call. And I say, I didn't, because where I come from, there is no Adam. We were making Adam. <laughs> so everything was very natural. And the Jamans, the groups where I come from, we were all rivers. It's not that you are a river and the rest they are all born Muslim. We were all rivers, all. The one, the Imam, me, you, everyone, we were all rivers. Which is also something very strange. Then I, I found out about that when I went to Europe or other countries. Then I found out that there were also normal Muslims who don't believe in many things and they don't pray much or they don't even pray at all. And, and I say, well, how can that be? We thought that Islam was only about spirituality. Yeah, you are so rare. Yeah, way later on, which is good because we were just beginning and we were interested in these other things, which is mostly something which is about, you can call it love in the reality of what that means. Love is not necessarily something just emotional related to having fun. Love is also related to all these things. We can call it fitra now, now that I learned Arabic after <laughs> many years. Then I can put labels on that. But in that time, there was no labeling process, like on a factory that you put labels, this is chocolate, this is the, the price, the ingredients, no. It was just a raw candy that you eat and you say, man, this is good. That's what I was looking for. As I was telling you, it was very natural. And we regained, we recovered, or maybe rediscovered, uh, about uh, life, again. about uh, friendship, about family, about um, generosity as well. And we found many answers. And then it made much more sense you know, basic things about profits, about the amount of profits. Then in Islam, there are a big amount of things which are very clear that in the rest of the religions or in the rest of the common knowledge, they are not very clear. The, mostly in the Christian world, this, this kind of fantasy about Jesus, about saying, Isa, alayhi salatu wasalam, that doesn't make much sense. And it brings even more confusion and it makes it look like it's just nonsense. Like religion is pure nonsense only for people who are men mentally disturbed. But thanks to, to Maulana Sheikh Nasim and real people, we found out that no, it was much more than that. And that the real nonsense is inside Western civilization. Yes, yeah, uh, most of uh, what we thought is that religion was uh, something for people who cannot deal with reality properly. So they need to uh, find a place to hide themselves and, and to find like a way to kind of live some kind of fantasy in order to, to deal with deception of this life and of what people say this life is, which it looks like something very unpleasant, 
or, and to deal with the problems of reality and that. But then we found out that there was also people who had uh, some uh, real approach for, for religion or for spirituality. And also that those two things were linked, were the same thing, they were not different. There was because also we thought that there was spiritual people and religious people. And then they, we found out that no, it's the same thing. And uh, that was the, the main thing we, that brought us to, to where we are here now. And uh, then we un understood that the real deception is in Western life, which is offering only a life of uh, just plain suffering in which you wake up, if you wake up, and you go to your job, and then you go back to your house, and then you go to sleep, and then that same story gets repeated till you die. So it looks, and it sounds very depressing, you know, like uh, that doesn't sound like life. Of course, we, we didn't know what we were looking for. It was just a big need of, uh, now we will say, a big need of reality or light or love, or I don't know how to put it. And now I can say we were looking for this, or I can use even Arabic words, but in that time, no. We were only like naturally attracted to, to people who were different than the people we met before and different from us. So before we didn't have belief, we were even against belief because it's not something strange. It's a natural logical process of someone who is willing to understand and has kind of a fair mind. When you see what people who have like this kind of fake religion or fake uh, lifestyle about religion or spirituality, then you say, no, this is nonsense. And the things, the, the tales that they tell you in modern Christianity, like coming from a Catholic country like me, then, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It's a lot of uh, confusion and no one seems to be telling the truth. And the people that we met, that they looked religious, they didn't have any kind of wisdom in what they were saying. So it was very hard to believe in them and then we found people that they were saying things that are much more logical, that they make sense and they explain a lot about uh, life, about uh, human beings, about, and also about things that in other traditions they are mixed up, about, like we were saying before, about the amounts of, of prophets yani, and the amount of, of awliya, of saints in the world, and everything gets like complete inside Islam, which is quite preserved, and, every, and there's proof for everything, and everything's on the table. That was very strange as well, like saying, yeah, the prophet, that where is he? Then he's married here, and say, so, well, how can that be spared here? Yeah. Like everything was on the table. And in other uh, places or other situations, let's say, things were under the table. You were always felt that this doesn't make sense because they have a lot of things to hide. They were hiding the truth, Yanni. And uh, that was not something very inspiring, to be honest. To be honest, in my life. But the rest is something that it, it was about kind of a very progressive, like, uh, understanding about myself. And that was very helpful as well. Because I was trying to do that throughout my life. But there, were, there was not much of progress, because also in psychology, for example, if you do therapy, psychological therapy, then you can more or less diagnose, they can tell you, oh, no, you know, I think you are depressed. And you say, you know what, I also think I'm depressed, but what are we going to do about it? And then you are left like barefoot. So we, when you go to therapy, you can understand a few things about yourself, but there's not like a, like a place or like the tools to do something about it. There's something like that. But when you have a, a spiritual teacher, real one, he will help you to that. Not only to acknowledge him, not only to see it, but also to say, yeah, I am jealous or I am angry or I, am, I have this problem or that. And also he will make situations for you to face it somehow and to deal with it more or less. And then it starts to repeat, 
wise men said that say in many traditions that life repeats itself again and again till you more or less get the lesson, which is hard because we are not used to listen or to see or we are always with phones and cameras and something is blocking your eyes or blocking your ears or everything. And I hope that is a good answer for your questions as well. Well, um, one of the big things that changed is that uh, my every day, let's say, daily life, Yanni, it got like uh, complete. It got like uh, filled up with something that it was like a daily practice that was that also gave me like timing for my life, like prayer, for example, getting up, waking up for prayer and that. It gives you a rhythm that I was like very conscious about that, about the time or about what to do with my time or with my life and that, uh, that before having uh, any religious practice, it was you just wake up and you don't know what to do or what's going to be, have no idea. And, and Islam and Tariqa filled it up like in one go. Then you had prayer, then you have dhikr and you have also the, the speech of of your sheikh software. And life came back, it came back to life. Yeah, it's like putting water to plants. They go green again. And then life makes much more sense, much, I don't know why. You know, there was something big part of what I'm saying is just the surface of something that I got to realize many years after. It's like everything, like in, in old times, people, they were teaching this way. They were telling you, don't ask many questions, just come with me and then you will learn in the process. Which for modern people like us, like me, is almost impossible because you need a lot of proof of explanation. Tell me this, tell me that. Tell me. But for me, alhamdulillah, I was not as much as that. I was just following Yanni and enjoying the ride a little bit. And there was these small things, these small details that meant a lot for me. Like, for example, we were going to Dikr to Thursday night meditation, or I don't know how to say that in English. And we were just meeting there, and the one who was leading the, the meeting, Yanni, he was talking a bit. He was very inspired as well. He was telling a few stories. And we were having tea, and the tea we tasted so good, you know, the tea was so nice. And then I found out that he was putting rose water in the tea, that's why. <laughs> but it tasted so good. And even the clothes that they were wearing was, mashallah, this is, now I can say mashallah, but in that time I was just saying, man, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. All that I had made sense, made perfect sense. All what I had before Tarika didn't make sense. And it was something that it could be questioned. It could be doubtful. It was saying, did, he, did people really went to the moon on a rocket and landed? And then the guy stood out and then they came back to Earth. Yeah, well, you, you believe it, Yanni. You're like, how can you prove it? You cannot go to the moon. But you never, you never have like certainty about it. But when I came to Tariq and when I spoke with the brothers and I get to the software, Yanni, to the meeting, to the speech, to the books in and of Maulana, everything made sense, hundred percent. It was completely right. Everything made sense for first time in my life. And they were answers for things that they are like deep questions that you cannot even pronounce. They say that one of the difficult problems when you're the main problem, when you are after 10 years old, let's say, is that most likely in Western society or Westernized society, which is more or less everywhere nowadays, is that you have a lot of pain because the society is very cruel and nothing makes sense and everything's messed up, messed up, mixed up. And you just have a lot of pain and you don't know even how to express it. So, of course, we were all ha carrying that pain and we didn't even, even know that it was there. And all those questions, they don't disappear, they don't evaporate. They're still there inside yourself, but you don't even know how to bring them out uh, or to share them. And in the gatherings, the spiritual gatherings, those questions, they come out uh, somehow and you get an answer for something that you 
even maybe forgot about the Hashem. So everything made a lot of sense about ourselves, about life, about a uh, family, marriage, work, about the past of mankind, about the future as well. And then we also got to know or to understand that many of the things that we were feeling, like that the world uh, is messed up, uh, there was because of a reason. And then everything came back to its place. You know, one of the uh, sayings that was a, like a very good explanation is that some they say that Sufism or Tariqa or spirituality in, the, in general is to put your foot inside the shoe, which is very simple, but for me it made a lot of sense. Because before, I don't know if we even had a shoe. <laughs> we were just naked of wisdom and naked of any explanations. You're just thrown into the world, do what you can, do what you want as well. Raised by TV, raised by uh, MTV, and not so very good quality music and not so very good quality friends or people. <laughs> and then no wonder you end up in drugs or alcohol or doing a lot of mistakes that then they don't make sense in the moment, but when you look back, they make even less sense. So back, we, so that's one of the main answers that everything went back to its place and days were filled up with things. And one of the things is that I, I started to, to wake up in the night naturally without an alarm. And I was thinking to myself, why am I waking like this in the night without an alarm and nothing. And they, they told me, no, they're waking you up. They're waking you up to pray. And then there was something to do in the night. Before it was just listening music or just playing games or nothing. But now I had something to do in the night. It made much more sense why I was awake in the night. Because if your day is void, then you cannot sleep at night. What are you going to do? And the, all those things, they are threatening because they're just symbols or expressions that your life is void. It's not that your day is void. It's not that you're necessarily depressed. It means that the life that Western civilization is offering you and me and all of us is void. And there's nothing really inside there instead of some kind of modern slavery in which you work for someone else that you will never meet, most likely, and is giving you in exchange a few, not even dollars, because we don't have that, <laughs> and then uh, you spend it in Coca-Cola, and that's it. Don't ask for more, because there's nothing there. And then, yeah, ask me. Yeah, that's a good question because, you know, the, one of the main feelings I got when I came to Islam or to Tariqa, which is even more strange, is that people were looking at me like saying, there's no need for religion. <laughs> there's no need for spiritual. What's your need for that? Like, life continues as it is. Uh, life is all right. You don't need to... You don't need anything else, Yani. You can have a life. You can have fun. You, why you need to stop uh, what you were doing in your life? Why to punish yourself without eating, for example, or it looks so difficult? I mean, what's the benefit? That was the main question that was written on top of how oh, their faces look like. Yeah, interesting. Like saying, <laughs> like saying who cares about that, you know? Because uh, if you are being successful in modern life, then what is the need to, to fast or to pray or even to make dua? If you have money, you don't need to make dua. Your life is sorted out. If you have a car, if people like you, if women like you, then it's done. No problem. What, what's the need for it? So some, they, they looked at me like strange, like saying, no, I think you're going mad, maybe. Maybe you lost your mind a little bit more. And some, they just took it as another strange thing that I was 
experiencing or that is just another new thing that maybe when you grow older you will leave it behind and you will come back with us to normal life. But well, it didn't happen uh, till now, but in that process, uh, many of the people that I had before, the friends or university or work or things like that, many they were like dropped by. And they, my, some of them, I never met them again. Uh, some of them, they just didn't understand the change. Or There was not like enmity. No one was like really against me or against Islam or something. No, no, nothing like that. Alhamdulillah, in, in Argentina, mostly in those days, we didn't have some kind of Islamophobia or no. Alhamdulillah, no. That, that was not the problem. The, the thing is that, as I'm saying, there was no a need why to be a Muslim. There's no need. Why to be in any kind of religion? Life is all right as it is. Yeah, my family didn't have a major issue about it. They were saying like, yeah, we don't understand, mostly. Uh, but that's it, do, do what you can <laughs> with life. And if it makes you feel better, well, what can we do about it? But uh, then I understood that it was something that I needed to do on my own. That I couldn't ask for other people to to share it with me. Then other people appeared and it was more like saying, yeah, okay, there's other people who are also interested in some kind of spirituality or, and then on time, people saw like the goodness about it or the goodness in this practice. And they more or less got some kind of inspiration, Gianni, but my story is not the story of people joining me a lot, no, or people like saying, yeah, now we're all going to be Muslims. No, not necessarily. Because um, it was something that also in, in my life, Yanni, it was very much about trying to, 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 to deal with myself, Yanni, to understand myself somehow. Then the process of other people like looking at me, like now, on an interview, it came way after that, which is very good. Because in that time, I didn't know what was going on to be honest, with me or with Islam or nothing. It was mostly about myself. It was mostly about uh, trying to to get to, to know myself, which is a big thing, even though uh, it sounds like something simple. It can take a lifetime. And for me, it was important. It was important to know uh, what was wrong with me because also led for me to understand that there was this need to uh, find or to have something uh, different in my life. And then it came the, the reality of, of having a, a, a spiritual teacher. Because it was not only to get my life fixed, then I understood that it is also about uh, that one of the stories about that that made me understand the Lord is that one of these, uh, one of these, like uh, Sheikh Yani, he spent some time with one uh, one very intelligent person who was with him for some time and his murids, and then this this kind of murid Yani, kind of disciple, went to see the Sheikh and said, you know, Sheikh. I have seen that what people are doing with you is trying to imitate you and do what you do as much as they can. And the Sheikh there said, yeah, well, that's true. That's what they're supposed to do. And this, this kind of disciple, he said, yes, yeah, you know, I can do that. I can imitate you. But I'm afraid that if I follow you completely, I will stop to be who I am. So uh, the Sheikh looked at him and told him, yeah, it's okay, but uh, do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? So that was something, when I heard that story, it made me understand much more about this thing that I just went for, that it, when you uh, follow and you take from, from one of a real spiritual teacher, then you find a lot about yourself, who you really are. 
I never saw, I never saw in my whole life more beauty or better people that in the, uh, the surroundings, in the vicinity of the beloved people of Allah, of the saints, of the awliya. I never saw some, anything better than that. I never saw anyone more loving or more uh, uh, happy or more beautiful or more well-mannered than, than the sheikhs of Islam, let's say, and our elder brothers as well. I saw them and I maybe I felt like being like them, you know. That's a strange thing because in the education I had was opposite to that. Don't follow anyone, do what you want, and just be, be, be the, yeah, people should look at you. You shouldn't be looking at anyone. <laughs> you should be very successful. And then I was looking at someone and I felt human, like uh, unconsciously, maybe I said, I want to be like them. And that means a lot because, uh, as I told you, we were not educated to do that, to Im imitate anyone. It was always tr like this individual education for you to stand out, to be, to, to be or to feel better than other people. And then I felt uh, or I saw people uh, who were inspiring to me. I never saw better exemplary manners. They were the best example I ever saw. Well, oh, I don't know, there's so many things. The soul is endless. This is an ocean of things, and there's plenty of pearls and jewels and, and that, but I think the, the kindness is something that inspired me a lot. I never saw uh, more, more kind stories than uh, the stories about the about Rasulullah Sallallahu himself, or his Sahaba, or the Awliya, or the Messi. Uh, they were, and sometimes you're like speechless, you know, and you felt like crying straight away. Now, um, and sometimes it's even hard for me to remember the story because it's just a feeling. You know, there was one story of a lady who saw Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she was saying, I saw such a man that his face was glowing with uh, light. That was shocking to me, you know, like saying, what is that light? Like, I want to see that light. What is, what's that, you know? And when they were speaking about his manners. And also one, this one hadith that he, Rasulullah Wasallam, is saying in the end of, no, in Yawm al in Judgment Day, the people who are going to be closer to me are the people with the best manners. Then I understood that also, Maulana was saying more than once, that the highest knowledge is adapt, is manners. And for me it was shocking because Western education is opposite to manners. It's like the highest knowledge for university, for universities, it's just knowledge. <laughs> There's nothing else. But then I understood that the highest knowledge is is manners because that's also one of the most inspiring things. And the world is kept by manners about, not about being polite on a superficial level. It was about being good to people. Because if there are no manners, if there's no kindness, no goodness, then this world, it doesn't worth living in it. It's just trying to steal a few things from someone else, trying to be on top of everyone else, and you're just left alone. Who is going to help you in the night if you fall on the street? No one can even see you in the night. Who is going to uh, to help you if you treat everyone else like uh, they should be serving you? That's different. And when 
like this goodness, then everyone's heart starts to open because the, the whole environment gets relaxed. And people say, okay, I'm not going to get killed. I'm not going to be robbed. I'm not going to be deceived. Uh, then there's trust again in life. It's hard to relate to a specific event because next to the Aulia we have seen so many miracles that it's even hard to, to, to remember all of them. But what I can say is that uh, one, of, one of those events is that um, I went one time to, to Cyprus to the house of Roland and Seis Nassim, and then I went to uh, Germany for some time and they ca I came back and I went to sleep and then when I woke up I had the feeling and I woke up and walked like I was in my parents house and then I realized oh no no I'm in Cyprus he was so familiar to me he was he brought me back to my fitra, we'll say now, to my own nature, so much that I felt more at home than even in my parents' house because it brought my heart back to its place. And uh, there, were, there was like a growing back to what it brought me here to the first place in a Without all these big explanations, he was just coming back to life. It's like life was cut in a moment of, of my life when you get all this uh, education in civilization, let's say, and your life uh, gets cut and you don't know who you are anymore. After doing this and getting like adapted to, to this kind of game, that we're playing, then you forget who you are, why you came here in the first place. And uh, then I, I found again, like uh, growing, going back to, to nature and the thing that connected me in a more natural process with my, with this, with my life. Yeah, I think the one of the main problems was to find like a, a place to get closer to to like an environment where you can uh, be a be a Muslim somehow, which is very difficult today. There's no people usually they don't believe. People usually they want you to be different in order to be suitable for works or for money or and uh, there's not like a place for you to stop for a little while in your life you all, as soon as you get some age maybe let's say 18 or even less you just need to go and work and that's it there's no room for mistakes there's no room for waiting there's no room for getting to know yourself there's no room to do something besides of getting some money, getting some income, unless you are rich, which I wasn't. So there was not a place for me to stop and to say, okay, uh, I need to stop. Yeah, that was one of the biggest the problems that I faced, or that many people faced, I think, that there was no room for you to get to uh, to know yourself or to practice a little bit or even to 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 have like a small room for you to to express yourself somehow without the rush and the need on and the stress of working of uh, getting money which was difficult as well and for you to to share with other people in a, a, an environment which people more or less believe, or they're trying to believe, or they're trying to to help each other somehow. There was not much room for them. Mostly when you reach that age, then you are supposed to be thinking about getting a job, or getting a degree, or getting a career, and that's it, come on, let's go to life. You, need, you just need to be a decent beast 
on the engine of a factory. And I didn't want that. I think inside myself I was refusing that. I was saying, no, no, man, and I don't want to get there. And society forces you into that. It forces you into be a decent uh, piece of a machine for the machine to carry on, for the show to go on. And sometimes you want the show, the show to stop. You want to say, okay, okay, I don't know who I am. Can we stop? And the world will say, I'm sorry, gentlemen, but we cannot stop because no one cares about you in the first place. You just are supposed to do what you're told, what you're told. So for me, it was difficult because I really need, needed to stop and to, to get to know myself somehow. And the only environment and the only real tools for that was in the environment of Tarika and mostly uh, with Maulana, with Maulana Sheikh himself. Because he is going and he was going to give like the place and the tools and his guidance for you to be able to, to get to know that, to get to know uh, yourself mostly because uh, they say that a broken heart, it's an open heart. And some of us, we were heart broken, but in order to be functional in life, Yanni, then you don't heal your heart. You don't solve your problems. You just put something on top of it. <laughs> you just cover the wound and that's it. Then you just carry on. But uh, that that need is never fulfilled completely. It's never fulfilled. Till you feel that, like Rumi was saying, and that it took me a while to understand as well, every pain beside his pain of, of the longing for the love of Allah, let's say, uh, let's say that every love beside his love of Allah is pain because it will let you down because human beings they do this and then they do this other thing and this and that so you never get the thing that your heart is looking for then you can only get that with the people who have that that will bring you closer to that love and that love will never end and even if you die then it will be all right then we have this big fear of death, but we are not afraid of dying. I was not afraid of dying. No one, no one is really afraid of dying. We are really afraid of dying as nothing happened in your life. Like you spend the life for nothing, or you never reach that real love or that true love. So this which is Tariq and which is the beloved people of Allah, that's why they're beloved, is real love. And even if you die, then maybe it's even better because you will go to that love to meet again in that first meeting. And that's it. There's an, interest, an important story in this because I always forget about talking about miracles. I don't know why. And that's the main thing about this. One time I was going from Spain to London to see Maulana Sheikh, Sheikh Muhammad. And I had a small dream in which we were praying with him and everyone stood up and go out. And he stood up and left. And he left behind a waistcoat, a beautiful like golden, not golden, but like, like yellow, a beautiful waistcoat that he had. He left it on the ground, he forgot it. And I took it and I gave it to him. And he looked at me in dreams. He's very different than how it is in, in like, this uh, reality. He looked at me and he told me, but you don't have a waistcoat, no? And I said, yes, Sheikh, but this is yours. And he took it and he looked at me and he was very happy about it. And that was the end of the dream. And then I understood that it's not the same thing to go to your Sheikh to try to take something from him than to be with him. That's real love. Not when you want to take a benefit from someone, but just that you feel good or you, or you love to be with them. Because then that thing revives 
that love that is inside yourself as well, that it was forgotten. There's plenty of advice. There's a lot of advice. Ad dinun nasiha, no? So there's plenty of that. But what I can say from my own experience, which is interesting, rather than reading a book or relating hadith, is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, you know. And mostly don't be afraid of leaving things behind. Because what you will find after leaving things behind is far, is way better than those things. Whether if it is money, whether if it is a success of any kind, social or fame or uh, friends or girlfriends or boyfriends or a house or a car or a dog, leave all those things because leave it, don't worry. Don't be afraid of leaving all those things. And as much as you leave behind, the more you will get. Um, even if you can throw your bag instead of emptying your bag, even if you can throw it away and just go through that door, even better. Trust me, you will never find what Allah is going to give you. You will never find it on your own. Never. This game doesn't work like that. It's not rewarding because of your own personal effort or your own ideas or your own intelligence. On the contrary, it works by surrender. When you really love someone, you don't ask many questions, do you? You just want to be with that person. And when you really, really, really love someone, you just feel like going to him or to her, isn't it? You're not asking questions, and it doesn't matter the answer. Or you just ask questions as an excuse, as a trigger to have a conversation to that person, just to get near. If you really love someone, you just feel being with that person, and you just want to be closer to him or to her, isn't it? When you see someone that you really love, you just want to be with that person, and just do it. That will, that's the main thing I will say. If it's true what you're feeling, it doesn't come from your mind or uh, it doesn't come from, from any rational deduction. Just go for it and you only need uh, to go there. There's no need for a lot of questions and answers and you just accept it. When you really want that, you don't have the need uh, to, um, to research a lot. And stay like that. Just stay like that. Don't lose that love. Because then, when you grow a bit older, then things take it. It's like the machine slows down a little and you start to use your mind again. And you start to get a lot of explanation and everything seems to be sorted out. And Don't let that thing happen in your life. Always try to renew that original moment in when you just felt pure love or pure inspiration. And if you lost it, try to go back again to that thing. And that's the only thing we are looking in life. One of the wise people that I remember was saying that when your life is complete, when your life is complete, is when your love is complete. When you think you really are okay and that you can die and nothing matters really, only you can say, you can really say that when you are fully in love, when your heart is full and then there's no fear. Maulana was saying so many times that when you are afraid, it's because your heart is a bit empty and you're actually afraid of dying in that state. You're not afraid of dying. You are afraid to die as you never lived. That's the summary.